Onward. Awesome, man. Those are great. You got a monster truck? And a motorcycle? That's great. Are you going to go to class or are we going to have a conversation? All right. Hey, see Miss Joni? Go with Miss Joni. There you go. Amen. Praise the Lord. Got to love it. See, some of y'all act like I'm scary. He don't think so. Amen. <laughs> Amen. First Samuel chapter 14. A big chapter we got today. First Samuel chapter 14. Let's do this. Let's pray one more time. Lord, would you open our eyes to see the truth of the passage? And God, would you help us to understand it? I pray that you'd give us what you want for us to have. Help us to take and apply it to our life. Lord, we sure love you. We're going to give you all the praise for all that you do here this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you remember from, from chapter 13, I like to do this and just pick up where we left off in chapter 13. The Bible tells us from verse 19 on down, uh, we know that the Philistines are coming because Saul, he won a small victory. And we, we look at the importance of understanding as you, you win a small victory, that doesn't mean the devil's going to turn tail and run. He's going to bring back force. And that's just going to be the life of every believer. As you continue to fight spiritually, it, it's not going to be over until Jesus comes back. You're going to fight the world, the flesh, and the devil until you die or the Lord returns. And that's okay. That's part of what we signed up for when we got saved. We knew that. And so, praise the Lord, don't ever stop fighting. That's a terrible thing. Verse 19, there was no smith found through all, all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make them swords or spears. But all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share and his coulter and his axe and his mattock. Yet they had a file for the mattocks and for the coulters, for the forks and for the axes to sharpen the goads. So it came to pass in the day of battle... But there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan. But with Saul and with Jonathan, his son, was there found. And the garrison of the Philistines went out to the passage of Michmash. So you find that the nation of Israel is in it. They're in a strait. They're in a strait because they're being outnumbered greatly by, by troops of, of the Philistines. A massive army, as we, we read um, in verse 5 of chapter 13. 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. This is quite an army, and they're coming against the nation of Israel. And, and not only do you find that they're severely and massively outnumbered, but you find that they are very ill-equipped. And so as you look at that, you think, there's, there's two swords in this entire army. We got two swords, and we're going against this massive amount of force. Sometimes we look at life. Again, we like to take the physical that we find in our passage and, and look at that with the spiritual that we look at. Sometimes the odds, that there's no chance. Like, I can't beat this. I, I'm lost. I lost. Right? I, I've, I've woke up in the morning and think, man, we, we're going to, I lost today. Today stinks. Right? You ever done that? It's not a good attitude and certainly isn't giving God the benefit of the doubt. But I've done that many times. And uh, to my shame... But we do that. That's Saul's heart. And that's Saul's attitude as we get into chapter 14. But we're going to find as you look at the passage that you always learn by, by people. I learned as a child what not to do from my parents. I also learned things that I should do from my parents. Okay. And we're going to learn in this passage there are things that, hey, you should avoid these things. And sadly, those things that are taught to us from chapter 14, which we should avoid, are given to us by the king. Someone who should have the character, someone who should have the integrity. And we learn from someone who is a subordinate, his son, what to do, while we learn from the king what not to do. Look at verse 1 of chapter 14. Now it came to pass upon a day. I like that. The Lord is just a blessing. Upon a, there was a day, you know. That Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man that bare his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistines garrison that is on the other side. But he told not his father. Hey, let's go look at what's going on. <laughs> but he takes one man with him, his, his armor bearer. Now, his armor bearer is another testament that we're going to look at today. The armor bearer of Jonathan is, is, is not named, but he's a great man. That is a fantastic individual. And he goes. Like, okay, the army of Saul, no chance. 
hey, let's just you and me do it. Right? It doesn't say they're going to go fight. It just says, hey, let's go see. In verse 2, the Bible says, And Saul tarried in the uttermost part of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which is in Migron, and the people that were with him were about 600 men. Once again, when you're comparing that to the thousands of chariots and horsemen and people, that the 600 men is nothing. But we've seen, we've seen God do this before. In verse 3, the Bible says, And Ahiah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh, wearing an ephod, and the people knew not that Jonathan was gone. So we find that Saul is there, but he's there with the priest of God. And you would think, okay, if I'm in the right place with the priest of God, that I'm, I'm doing right. Not always is that the case. Sometimes the right thing to do is to, is to be in the battle. In verse 4, the, and between passages... By which Jonathan sought to go over unto the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock on the one side, and a sharp rock on the other side, and the name of the one was Bozes, and the name of the other, Sini. The forefront of the one was, sit, was situate northward over against Michmash, and the other southward over against Gibeah. Like the details that were given, if we had a map, we could see what's going on and where they're going and how they're approaching the Philistines. These things are, are, are somewhat important if you're studying the the way they're going into battle. In other words, for lack of time, we'll, we'll, we'll say it this way, they're going with a great disadvantage. They don't have the advantage. They don't have the high ground. They're actually going up to the Philistines. Not only are they going up, but the Philistines are behind places of armament, places of refuge, places by which they can defend themselves. And say, hey, let's go up there anyway. Let's fight this anyway. The, all we can see as we go along, the, the spiritual application is great because so many times it is pointless. We think it's pointless. I have fought this battle. I have lost. The devil keeps winning. I keep losing. And he might have the high ground. But that's why 2 Corinthians chapter 10 says, right, bringing to captivity every thought. But what he said, we, we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Right. The weapons of our warfare are spiritual. They're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What you find here is a stronghold, a place where they are secure. The enemy is secure. That doesn't mean that the enemy has to win. Just because the enemy is secure. It might, the Philistines have consistently won for decades. They have won. That doesn't mean that they have to be secure here and now. Learn this, church. Learn this. Because spiritually speaking, sometimes we, we get in an attitude of defeat because we have constantly and consistently been defeated. We think, well, that's just the way it has to be. No, no. It is not the way it has to be. Doesn't matter how secure the enemy is. Doesn't matter if they have the high ground. Doesn't matter. We're still told we can win. Look at this. Look at verse 6. Verse 6 is beautiful. And Jonathan said to the young man that bears armor, Come, let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. It just might happen. You know what that is? The epitome of giving God the benefit of the doubt. That's what that is. It just may be. Like, let's just try it. Let's just see if God doesn't do something. I want to preach that verse so badly. We have a big chapter to look at. But guys... Going, going against the world, the flesh, and the, just going against your own flesh. It may be that if I stand up to the, 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 the things that come into my mind, if I stand up to the temptations that the devil lays out in front of me, it just may be that if I stand against those, God will work for us. As a matter of fact, we, we're not in the Old Testament anymore. It's guaranteed that if we will do that, God will work for us. We have a promise from God. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful every time. So don't just think, but I've always lost. Don't think that way. Don't think that. Think it may be that if I stand against this enemy, God will do something mighty. And it just may be. Look at this. Let's read it again. And Jonathan said to the young man that bears armor, come. And let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord 
to save by many or by few. God is not limited to say, well, in order for you to win, you're going to need uh, uh, 17,000 more volunteers so that we can make this happen. God doesn't need anybody. We are privileged to be used of God in any capacity that he sees fit. But he didn't need me to do it. He doesn't need you to do it. He needs us to be willing to submit and say, Lord, will you do it? The greatest victories in all the Bible, you can see them. They're not people doing wonderful things. They're people that God has allowed to do wonderful things against all odds. Gideon went up against multitudes with 300 men. No way he should have won. David, no way he should have won. Right? Well, you, you think the, the battles that we've seen. Look at the nation of Israel in Exodus chapter 14 as they're leaving Egypt. <laughs> they got a mass, the world power of their day. Egypt coming at them, chariots, horses, everything. And the Red Sea over here and all they have is farm tools. It's similar to this. You think, there's no way we're going to win. But you don't understand what God can do with people who are willing to submit themselves to him. Nobody saw the Red Sea opening as an option. Here's, here's where we're limited. We think, well, I, I don't see how God's going to be able to do this. This is beyond what God can do because I promise you the nation of Israel didn't think, yeah, he could always just split this open and we can just get out of here. Wasn't even a thought. We look, at, we look at the things like this pew is where it is and those walls are where it is and my circumstance is what it is. You don't understand that God, he does the impossible. Right? In Joshua chapter 6, <laughs> when they go to Jericho, you know how walls fall down in Jericho? They marched around it, blew trumpets and yelled. Yeah, that knocks walls down every time. It doesn't. How does that work? People who just did what God said, trusted that God would do what he said he would do, and they just, God does great things, even though, like, that's not something I've ever seen before. You ever see a multitude of people defeated by two, two guys? Not the best there are? No. But God, he says in verse 6, for there is no restraint to the Lord. That means you can't tie God's hands. You can't hold God back just because you are ill-equipped. That doesn't limit God. It just makes what he does shine brighter. <laughs> it's like that's a bigger deal now because I, I couldn't do it. It's a bigger deal when the Red Sea parts because I never thought of it. Right, Ephesians chapter 3, the Bible says, Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above. Although we ask or think. Like I've asked for some crazy stuff in my life from the Lord. Right? We probably all have. We've gone to the Lord and said, Lord, I know this sounds crazy. And the Lord's like, you have no idea what crazy looks like. Because he can do things that we can't imagine. I can't even think or consider. I go back to the nation of Israel. Parting the Red Sea was not in their mind. They didn't think, oh, he could always just do that. No big deal. They didn't think of that. Nobody does. So Jonathan's heart and Jonathan's attitude is incredible because he understands, well, this isn't about what I can do. He doesn't say, let's see what we can accomplish. He says, no, God can do it. He doesn't need more than us because it's not us anyway. Verse 7, and his armor bearer said unto him, do all that is in thine heart. Turn thee. Behold, I am with thee according to thy heart. I, I said at the beginning of this that we learned some things from the characters in this chapter. Some of the things we learn not to do as we're going to see as we go along is Saul. He, he's foolishly affected by his fear. And therefore, he does not exercise courage. He doesn't exercise faith or trust in God because he is so fearful of the situation. Jonathan, who is under the authority of Saul, says, well, what about, you know what, God can do something. And then you have someone who's even under him who says, do all that is in thine heart, I'm with you. The best, the best worker on the job is a person who says, 
Yeah, boss, I'm with you. Let's do it. Let's get this done. The best wife in this room says to her husband, I support you. Let's do that for the Lord. The best, the, the, every aspect of our authority is greater when we say, do it, I'm with you. Every single time. Jonathan was told this. I was told this years ago as I, as I assisted our former pastor. It, this verse was given to me. How do you, how do you best serve some, underneath of someone? Jonathan's armor bearer. That's the best way to do it. Support it. Be there. That's the best way to do it. And you find the way that this unfolds, these two men are full of God. They're full of courage. They're full of faith. And God does great things. Verse, verse 8. Then said Jonathan, Behold, we will pass over unto these men, and we will discover ourselves unto them. If they say thus unto us, Terry, we will come up to you, then we will stand still in our place and not go up unto them. But if they say thus, come unto us, then we will go up, for the Lord hath delivered them into our hand, and this shall be a sign unto us. You ever do stuff like this? It's not always recommended. Okay. But there are, there are some things that the Lord used, specifically in the Old Testament. I'm not saying that they're wrong to use today. There are things that you, you can, Lord, I don't know what to do, so I'm going to lay these things out in place. Would you help me to be able to see what to do? Right? If there's a brick wall in the way, I'm, I'm going to be smart about it and turn around. I'm not going to be like, oh, that's just the devil's opposition and try to run through the brick wall. All right? Use some sense. That's what he's doing. He's, he's trying to exercise the sense that God gave him. Also, he's trying to exercise the faith in the Lord. So he says, look, if, if they want to fight on their terms, this is strange. That's how I know that God's winning. They want to fight where we have the, the better position. We're going to walk away, which is backwards from the way that anyone would think. That's the opposite of how you, you and I would want to be in control of the situation. We wouldn't say, if they want us to go up where they have a fortified position, if they want us to come up to where they have all this security, that's how I know that God's in it. <laughs> You're like, you picked the wrong one, Jonathan. That's, that's not, not how war works. works. Battle, Battle is always won by that person who's got, got the better position. position. He, he said, no, no, no. That's how I know that it's going to be just God. It can't be us. What, we, what is he doing? He is removing any element of what he can accomplish. It's out of the way. Couldn't be me. When this thing's over, Jonathan didn't do it. Except for the fact that he exercised all that faith and all acknowledging that God was all powerful and could do some great things. Verse 11, and both of them discovered themselves unto the garrison of the Philistines. And the, and the Philistines said, behold, the Hebrews come forth out of the holes where they had hid themselves. That's a mocking term. And the men of the garrison answered Jonathan, his armor bearer, and said, come up to us and we will show you a thing. Let me show you something. Hey, check this out. Look, they knew they were being played, but that was the deal. Hey, if they want us to come up there, that means God's going to do something. That's incredible. For the Lord had the, and, then, and Jonathan said unto his armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord had delivered them into the hand of Israel. I say this about Jonathan once again concerning him and his armor bearer. Jonathan did not put his armor bearer in front of him. That's actually unusual. Because the point of the armor bearer was, is essentially a bodyguard. Joab had six of them that bear his armor. They went around and they, they protected him. He said, follow me, I'm going. That's, a, that's interesting, considering the position that he is in. He's the prince of the nation of Israel, and his armor bearer is supposed to be there to protect him. And he says, no, you come after me. It represents something spiritually to us as, as God's people who are supposed to lead by example. We're not supposed to be like, hey, brother, you go out there, I'll back you up. No, 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 no. Leading by example. That, that's courage. And it makes his armor bearer that much more courageous. 
when people follow you and they see that you lead by example, and that you believe what you say, and that you do what you believe, they have no problem following behind a person who is confident that God is able. Verse 13, And Joshua, Jonathan climbed up upon his hands and upon his feet, and his armor bearer after him, and they fell before Jonathan, and his armor bearer slew after him. So they went up there and they started killing people. I love the Bible. And that first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men, within as it were half an acre of land, which a yoke of oxen might plow. And so this is amazing. This, this, this. Go back. Jonathan and his armor bearer say, hey, let's, let's just go see what's going to happen. It may be that God will fight for us. It may be that God does something great. It may be. Let's give it a shot. They killed 20 people. Now, if you go back to chapter, chapter 13, look at me at verse 5. This is important for you to see this. Verse 5 says, And the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel. They didn't come to sell potpourri. Okay? They are, they are mighty men of valor. They are, and there are a lot of, look at this, 30,000 chariots. I don't know if you can imagine how many that is. It's a lot. 30,000 is a lot. I mean, 6,000 horsemen. And people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. Pastor, why'd you read that yet again? Well, think about it. What is 20 men in an army that size? Those 20 men could have stayed home. It would have made no difference. You ever, you ever wonder things like, the Bible gives us details, and you think, okay, why is that detail there? Why, why did you say that they killed 20, two guys killed 20 men? That's pretty good, considering the odds are against them. That's, that's 10 per man. It's not bad. But 20 people is, is nothing in an army that you can't count. There's no number here. But why does that matter? Because read the next verse. Look at verse 14, one again. Chapter 14, verse 14. And that first slaughter. First of all, you see, it's the first one. It's not the last one. Which Jonathan, his armor bearer, made was about 20 men within, as it were, a half acre of land, which a yoke of oxen might plow. Why does that matter? Well, verse 15. And there was a trembling in the host, in the field, and among all the people, the garrison and the spoilers. They also trembled. And the earth quaked, so it was a very great trembling. Twenty men shouldn't tremble a host that big. Twenty men should be like, oh, hey, grab a few guys and go knock these two guys out. We can fix this real quick. Okay? But this is what, this is what we had to see from the beginning of the chapter. Jonathan knew in verse 6, it may be that God. We do a little bit. Like everything that we do for the Lord, is, is, it's very insignificant. Okay, It might be a big deal. This is a big deal. I'm not saying it's not a big deal because they had to go outside of the protection of the rest of the army. And they had to make a move for God. But they didn't have to conquer the, the Philistines. All they did was kill 20 guys. Not a big deal. But that was enough for God to say, okay, I'm going to bless that. Here I come. That's all it took. We have to see that because sometimes we think, well, I can't take on that great enemy. Well, maybe you don't have to. Maybe you take on that little piece that God told you to take on and watch him do the rest. We get consumed with this mentality of that's just too much. Well, God didn't say take it all out. He said do a little bit. You think, do you really think, guys, I'm having a good time. I hope you are. Amen. Do you really think that Jonathan and his armor bearer shook the earth? Did the earth shake? Who do you think did that? Okay. You think they, they, they conquered this thing? You think they had a lot to offer? They didn't do that. All they did was exercise faith in what God could do. That's it. This is a great victory. We all are going to agree as we look at this chapter, this is a great victory for God. But it's also a great victory by God. He did it. So 
let me, let me try. I'll do my best to encourage you, church. Listen, it isn't the great battle that you need to fight. It's the little one. You can look at the enemy and think, it's too much. I can't handle it. I, it's way too big for me. I can't accomplish that. Start small. You know what, Jonathan? He, might, he, he had some faith in God, but you know what he didn't do? He didn't march to the front lines and go to the, to the place where all the massive army was. He went to a little place where there was 20 guys posted in a place. Okay? That's it. We think, well, we have to charge hell with a squirt gun. Uh, no, we don't. We have to use some sense and do what we can do. Jonathan knew he couldn't take on that whole army, but he knew he could probably take on them 20 guys with the help of the Lord. The, the mentality must be in our, in our minds enough to say, I don't need to do the great thing. I need to do the little thing. God does the great thing. Every time God does the great thing. And notice verse 15, there was trembling in the host. That's amazing. 50, 20 guys trembling in the field. And among all the people, the garrison and the spoilers, what, what happened? Something set them very uncomfortably. It doesn't say that it was because of these 20 guys, because it wasn't because of these 20 guys. God, the Bible uses this term quite, quite frequently. God discomfited them. <laughs> he made them uncomfortable. He gave them a sense of impending doom, dread. So that they were trembling. They don't know why. You ever, you ever been that? You're going to face a situation and you don't know why, but you're scared to death. It's like, I don't, I don't understand why, why this is that big. It's not even that big of a deal. Okay, if you were the big part of the army, you're, you left the land of the Philistines to win. You didn't leave to be uncomfortable. You didn't leave to lose. You've, you've been in control of the nation of Israel for decades. Since before Samson. The Philistines have conquered Israel since before Samson's time, and Samson, the Bible says, began to deliver them. He never conquered them. He began to deliver them. That's how long they've been winning. So they didn't leave the land to lose. Yet they're uncomfortable. They're trembling in the field. And the Bible says, and the earth quaked. So it was a very great trembling. You know what they knew? Oh, wait. God's here. There's a great trembling. Verse 16. And the watchmen of Saul in Gibeah of Benjamin looked. And behold, the multitude, look at the Bible, melted away. And they went on beating down one another. You know what God did? That's so neat. I get, I get, man, I get goosebumps thinking about this. God used these two guys. They did something. And gave God the credit. And then God turned the Philistines against one another. So they go on killing each other. That's the exact same thing that happened for Gideon. You remember this when we were back in Judges? Gideon gets to the... And where they, they're killing each other. The Bible says that God set every man's sword against his fellow. Wow. That's some way to win. Let's step, take a step back and look at the spiritual application. Sometimes I, I try to preach, I try to teach, I try to under, get our people to understand this. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, right? We don't fight against each other. But the devil has that same tactic. Sometimes God spe God's people spend so much time fighting one another. The devil's like, I don't have to worry about it. They'll kill each other. Let that not be the case. God started that thing. That was God's idea originally, that the enemy would fight each other. It was never intended that God's people would fight each other. That's foolishness. That's how the devil wins. We cannot do that. That's just a side note, but we find it in our passage, where that's what God is using as a way for him to get glorified. Well, that's what the devil uses in order to rob God of his glory. So that should never be what we do. Verse 17, Then Saul said unto the number, unto the people that were with him, Number now and see 
who was gone from us. He knew somebody did it. God didn't just go randomly go out and go, just start doing stuff. Somebody, look, this is historically true in the Bible. Somebody has to step out in faith before God does anything. And even Saul knew that. Hey, somebody, somebody went out and did something to make God do this. Who did it? He knew that. And when they had numbered, behold, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. And Saul said to Ahiah, bring hither the ark of God. For the ark of God was at that time with the children of Israel. And it came to pass while Saul talked to the priest that the noise that was in the host of the Philistines went on and increased. And Saul said unto the priest, withdraw thy hand. So he started to talk to God about it, you see. And then he stopped. He was distracted by the chaos over there. Verse 20, and Saul and all the people that were with him assembled themselves and they came to the battle. And behold, every man's sword was against his fellow. And there was a very great discomfiture. Now, coming back to verse 19 real briefly, I think this is, this is important for us to see. Saul said, bring the ark. And he starts to inquire of God. He starts to pray, we'll say. Spiritual application, we would pray. Did you know that there's a time where it's not time to pray? I know that sounds crazy considering the Bible says pray without ceasing. Well, there's, there's a time where we think, well, let me pray about this. And the Lord says, no, go do it. So the, the conflict going on on the other side of the Philistines was so great that even Saul, who has no spiritual discernment whatsoever, understood it's not time to pray. It's time to get out there and be a part of this thing. Sometimes we're like, you know, I know the Lord wants me to do this. I'm gonna pray. I've heard people say foolish things like this. I'm going to pray about it. You're going to pray about whether or not to obey God? Stop it. You know you're lying. That's foolishness. Well, I need to pray about whether or not the Lord would have me do this. Well, the Bible already told you to do this. What do you, what do you, I'm trying to be nice. But, I, but like, like, you don't need to pray about some things. Some things, it's time to go ahead and get up and do it. Right? Well, I'm praying, I'm praying for an opportunity to be a witness. Trust me. Everywhere you turn, there's an opportunity to be a witness. And everywhere you turn, there's going to be a hindrance to it. That's not God closing the door. That's called life. Well, I prayed about it and just nothing happened. That's because even God said, knock it off. I'm not trying to be smart now. Like, I'm saying like we, 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 we over-spiritualize so many things while we under-spiritualize other things. We give God credit for Him changing His mind about our life all the time, but we don't give Him credit when He does miraculous, wonderful things in our life. How, somehow that was the doctor who healed this, this problem, and God is the one who doesn't know what He wants for me to do. You see how we're giving God credit where it doesn't belong? God knew what He wanted you to do. He told you what He wanted to do, and you decided, I'm going to pray about it. What you really meant was, I'm going to try to get God to change His mind. A lot of us go to God with our mind already made up. Lord, this is what I want you to tell me. And I'm going to pray until you do. And you know what God's going to do? He's going to, he's going to let you do it. But that don't mean he's going to bless it. They wanted a king. God didn't want them to have a king yet. But God said, God said Samuel, protest solemnly. And then God said, give it to him. That wasn't his plan for them. Not yet. But he gave it to him. Sometimes we go to God. It's prayer time. Oh, it's prayer. Let me pray about it. Or, or you could just obey. Crazy concept. But what God did here in verse 19, 20, is God made such a ruckus in the enemy's camp that Saul's like, I don't think it's time. I think the answer's right there. <laughs> I think it's time to get up there and go, go see what's going on. And that was the answer. So he didn't even finish. He just said, withdraw thine hand. And Saul and the people... that. With him assembled themselves, and they came to the battle, and behold, every man's sword was against his fellow. That's that phrase that was used in Judges. I love that. And there was a very great discomfiture. Moreover, the Hebrews that were with the Philistines, we learned something in verse 21 that we didn't know before, but it says here, the Hebrews that were with the Philistines before that time, which went up with them into the camp from the country round about, even they also turned to be with the Israelites that were with Saul and Jonathan. So that means in the camp of the Philistines... There were Hebrews. Check out this, the spiritual application. It's beautiful. 
There were Hebrews in the camp of the Philistines that when they saw God doing something, they said, whoa, 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 we are on the wrong side here. Let's get right with God about this. How many times you look around and look at the world, you go to witness to somebody and they say, oh, I'm saved. What are you doing in this camp? I'm a believer. Are you sure? I'm not saying they're lost. I'm saying that their life appears. Look, so that you, you don't say I'm, I'm calling someone a lost person, even though I would. Don't, don't get me wrong. Okay. They are still Hebrews. They're just in the wrong place. They're still children of God, seed of Abraham, but they are not where they belong. They are fighting for the enemy. Once again, we used this term earlier, the devil will use that. Where we start fighting for the enemy. Because he's got a stronghold in our mind where we start to think that the people around us and God's people who love us and care for us and want the best for us and pray for us are our enemy. God doesn't use that. Satan does. But God doing this wonderful thing provoked the Hebrews to say, wait a second, what are we doing? When you see God do something wonderful, doesn't it make you glad you're on his side? Well, when I see God answer prayer, I'm like, man, I'm so glad. I've got a God who's alive and well, who answers prayer, who hears me, who moves on behalf of his holy name. I am so thankful, Lord. If I was in the world, or if I was in church and I was just living wrong, and I saw that it would want to provoke me to be a part of that. You ever hear about people... I, I, this has happened to me, guys. I don't know why sometimes I feel like when I'm teaching or preaching, it's like confession time for me. But I, I use myself as an example to try to be a blessing to you. There have been times where someone has said, thank God for this answered prayer in the church. A prayer that I had not prayed for. And I think, man, I sure would have loved to have been part of that. You ever been there? Man, you mean God did that wonderful thing? He didn't answer my prayer. I didn't pray for it. I forgot. But God did something wonderful. And you're like, man, I, I wish I was a part of that. I'm thankful. I mean, I'm so excited that God's still who he is. But I missed out. Because God was going to do something wonderful. And I left myself out of it. Nation of Israel here, they have people in the wrong place. They are missing out. Because they're not where they ought to be. Isn't that neat? I love, man, we're not going to finish this chapter. It's okay. It's a good chapter, though. I'm in a ball. Verse 21, more of the Hebrews that were with the Philistines before that time, which went up from them into the camp from the country round about. We, we mentioned before, the Philistines, they had conquered so much. They were in control. They had their foot on the neck of Israel at this time. And so there were so many of the Israelites that were just they're in bondage to the Philistines. They do the bidding of the Philistines. They're so used to, to following the word of their master. Never let it be that we are so at the call of the world so that they can say, this is what you should do. God's people should not respond to what the world says they should do. No. You're not my master. I have a king. Thank you. Brother Billy prayed that this morning. Lord, you are king. Praise God. I get excited about that. that. That word isn't used enough. It's so regal. It's powerful. You're the king. You're preeminent. You're everything. You're all in all. Don't let us think, oh, the world says I should do this, so I fall for that. No. They're not the king. They're clueless and deceived. Don't fall for that. But that's what happened here. Verse 22, likewise, all the men of Israel which had hid themselves in the Mount Ephraim, when they heard that the Philistines fled, even they also followed hard after them in the battle. There are some people that aren't serving the world, but they're not serving God either. They're sitting at home. They're hidden somewhere. The undercover Christian, right? Just, I don't want to be on anybody's side. I don't like confrontation. None of us do. I understand that. 
But even they were like, oh, man, you know, it'd be awesome if we could be on the side of God on this one. I'm going to get out of this hiding place and stand up to the enemy and do what God would have me to do. Isn't it amazing that when one, look, one guy said to his armor bearer, let's go see. And as you read the chapter, the way that it opens up and unfolds, you find God does wonderful things. Like, People who are backslidden on God, who have turned their back on things of God, are coming back home. People who are hiding from the fight, not in it at all. They're like, no, let's... Because one guy looked at another guy and said, it may be that God... Isn't that incredible? What could God do in a little church like ours if one guy would just say, you know what? What could God do if? Fill in the blank. I don't know if you're on the Philistine side. I don't know if you're hiding. I don't know if you're you're Jonathan and his armor. I don't know where we are today. But before God, look at yourself and say, Lord, what am I? Am I what I'm supposed to be? Am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Because we sometimes are not. I don't want, look, both of these groups of people, I don't want to be them. Right? I, honestly, I don't even want to be with Saul. I know that's where they're supposed, to, they're supposed to be following that leadership. I want to be with Jonathan, man. It may be that God. Step out. Verse 22 again, likewise, all the men of Israel, all the men of Israel which had hid themselves in, the Mount, in Mount Ephraim, When they heard that the Philistines fled, even they also followed hard after them in the battle. They got up and they went to war. They didn't say, oh, I'm working my way into it. You know, sometimes it takes a while. No, 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 no. They grabbed grabbed their pitchfork or something and said, hey, they got swords. I'll get one of theirs. (laughs) Amen. Verse 23. So the Lord saved Israel that day. And the, pa- and the battle passed over beth So the Lord saved Israel that day. Oh, Jonathan did something wonderful. You know what he did? He just provoked the Lord. He just got God's attention. He didn't do anything great. He said, it just may be that God will do something great. Let's stir it up and see what happens. That's it. I, I, it's always a blessing to know the end of the story. It really is. It's, a, it's an encouragement. It's wonderful to say God's going to win. I, I'm so excited. Even if God never answered a prayer in here, I, already, I read the end. I know what's going to happen. He wins. I want to be on his side because he's the winner. I'm not one of those people who cheer for the underdog. That doesn't make any sense to me. All right? Especially if you know they're going to lose. Okay? It's a blessing. Israel's the underdog in this passage. God brings him up. That's a blessing. But you know what? Why would you pick the Philistine side if you know they're going to lose? You know they are. The problem is this, and we're going to be finished. Look, look up again at verse 21. Moreover, the Hebrews that were with the Philistines. You know, every Hebrew knows that God made a promise to the nation of Israel and that they're, they're going to have that land and they're not going to be in bondage anymore. Every one of them knew that. Every Christian in this room knows that Jesus is coming back. Every one of them. You know what the Hebrews didn't know? Is it going to happen in my lifetime? So because they didn't know whether or not it was going to happen today or tomorrow or next year or even in my lifetime at all, they thought, well, the easier road is to just submit to the authority that I've been given. I'm not going to fight against the Philistines because they're our leaders. They are over us. Like the world is for every Christian in here, the oppression of the world, you could cave and say, well, it's just easier. Because I don't know if the Lord's coming. I know he's coming back, but I don't know if he's coming back today. But what if he comes back today? And we're fighting for the enemy. Now, all of a sudden, I got to change sides mid-battle like they did. I don't want that to be me. You want that to be, you really want to be like, Lord, I just didn't think it was going to happen today. I thought I had time. 
You don't have time. We don't got that kind of time, guys. It may be that God steps out and says, go get your bride. And I'm over here serving the world? Oh, that would be embarrassing. Wouldn't that be embarrassing? We're done. Look at 1 John chapter 2. You like how I said we're done and then I said turn to the passage? First John chapter 2, it's page 336 if you're wondering. Amen. Verse 28, he says this, And now, little children, abide in him, not in the world, in him. It's the same book in verse, in verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Right? That's, that's the same chapter. That's verse 15. Verse 28, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear... You know the word? He didn't say if. He said when. When he shall appear. We may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. You know what I think happened in the nation of Israel when these guys who were fighting with the Philistines decided they were going to fight for God? They were ashamed. Like, man, we're on the wrong side this whole time. What were we thinking? I think when the Lord comes back, not if, when the Lord comes back, we ought to, as God's people, have confidence and not be ashamed. Look up the word ashamed. It's not my football team lost. That's not a shame. That's pathetic that you think that. Ashamed is a very deep word. The Bible says that for Jesus Christ to hang naked on a cross was a shame. That's, that's, that's where the word comes in. So when the Lord comes back, you and I could be ashamed at his coming instead of excited and anticipating it. I think we ought to be more like, it's today. No, oh no, not today. I'm not even right with God. That's what happened for the Philistines, the nation of Israel. On the wrong side? On the wrong side? What are you thinking? Anyway, that was the first part of the chapter. That was the good part. Amen. That's God bringing great victory. The very next verse, it says, And God wrought a great victory. I'm paraphrasing. I can't quote it. That day. The very next verse. The nation of Israel, they're not doing good. How are you not doing good? Because our leader's a knucklehead. In, a, in the midst of God doing something wonderful, sometimes there's still people that just make you disheartened. And you're thinking, man, God's doing this great thing, but this guy messed it up. Don't be Saul. We'll get there next time. Lord, thank you so much for the word of God. Thank you for this passage. Thank you, Lord, that we don't have to do much for you to do wonderful things. We just have to trust you. I pray, Lord, you'd help us to do that. We sure love you. Thank you for the power of God. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the spirit of God. Please help us now to take and apply to our life the things that pertain to us from what we heard this morning. I pray, God, you prepare us now for this services. In Jesus' name, amen.